Climate change and corporate sector initiatives. Uh, we've been hearing quite a lot in the last few days about the role of business as a leader in the fight against climate change and how it's becoming increasingly prominent. And indeed, by its very nature, business can be both lighter on its feet and more decisive than governments. It's sometimes been said that while governments dither, business can act. Now, it doesn't always mean it acts in the right way. There's plenty of pernicious lobbying still underway, particularly from the vast fossil fuel sector trying to derail progress on climate change. But as and when it gets its act together, progressive business can be hugely influential. And I think part of the very tentative optimism about the next round of climate talks is that business is increasingly on board, and as Paul Pullman was saying yesterday, it's not only on board, it's actually pushing governments to go further and faster. We've got an excellent panel, all of them business people, to discuss how this can happen. Coming up now, I'll introduce you to the moderator, Mr. Venkatesh Valuri, who's known to many of you, I'm sure. Uh, Venki is one of the real inspirers for sustainable business in India. As chairman of Ingersoll Rand, he's been a powerful advocate of its role. And I remember him telling me just a couple of years ago about the work they're doing devising a simple compact refrigeration unit which can be run off the engine of a truck small enough to get down India's country roads. And that means being able to cut dramatically the amount of food that's wasted between harvest and going to market. So that's one of those indications of the way business can actually do something specific, concrete, and very, very direct in terms of providing a way to help tackle many environmental issues up front. I'm sure there'll be plenty more examples of that, so for now, I will hand over to Venkatesh Valuri. Thank you. It's been a long day, and uh, obviously this seems to be, hopefully, uh, one of the most interesting sessions because the corporate folks are over here. Uh, and it usually happens that the, the business is always kind of held responsible for uh, climate change issues, for issues which are uh, hopefully also corrective in nature, uh, and the technology they can actually bring uh, in terms of building a much better future for the future generations. Uh, I know we've heard a number of sessions since yesterday, uh, and we all understand that business truly plays an extremely important role in terms of driving uh, the future climate change impacts. And I think we've got a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, a group of leaders who are here uh, who in their own right have done uh, some great work, uh, who are thought leaders in their own right, uh, who basically have been driving what I would say is environmental sustainability and climate change issues around the world. Uh, let me introduce you, uh, Mr. Richard Fedrizi, CEO and founding chair, U.S. Green Building Council on my left, Dr. Henrik Madsen, Group President, CEO, DNV, GL on my right, Mr. Randall Newton, uh, Ingersoll Rand, Vice President of Enterprise Engineering, Mr. Glenn Schmidt, Director of Steering of Garment and External Affairs, Sustainability Communications, BMW Group. Uh, in the, uh, the BMW X3 standing, which is a fully uh, electric vehicle. Mr. Jeff uh, Seabright, Chief Sustainability Officer, Unilever. And Ms. Namita Vikas, uh, Senior President and Country Head, Responsible Banking Yes Bank. Now, before I turn over to the, to the, uh, to the speakers, uh, one of the areas which I certainly wanted to distinguish, distinguish between the developed world and the developing world, or the emerging economy and the developed world. For long, what we have seen in the markets for the last 30, 40, 50 years has been that the products developed in the West have really driven the market creation or the consumption pattern even in the emerging world. So it's been a, a, a process where we have talked about consumption patterns being tuned, being developed, based on products that were developed in the West. And therefore, it was a product 
developed in the developed world, which actually caused market creation in the developing world. I think if you really look at the environmental sustainability, climate change, we obviously we all understand that this kind of consumption pattern cannot sustain or cannot be actually applied in the future with probably almost three-fourths of the world population staying in this, in this part of the world. So now we need a model really is talking about a market-driven product creation which is sustainable, which is applicable to the majority of the population. So we need to move from this product-based market creation to market-based product creation, which is really relevant for this part of the world. Now, with that as a thought process, I would now like to start the discussion as each of the leaders will talk about what's been happening in their respective domains and in their respective market and how they have been actually driving uh, the, the, the change or addressing the change in, in uh, environmental sustainability. So let me begin with Dr. Hendrik Madsen, Group President and CEO from DNV. Excellent work has been done in the last decade to describe the global risk picture that government businesses and civil society needs to navigate. We know many of the consequences if we do not manage risk like resource exploitation, energy scarcity, climate change, and also biodiversity. But we also know that with every major risk arises opportunities. Opportunities that can benefit society, and that can create the businesses able to grasp them opportunities. It has been said that the main difference between whether an issue becomes a risk or an opportunity depends on when it is discovered. And to get the world back on a, towards a sustainable future, we more than ever need collaboration between regulators, business, academia, and civil society. No one can solve the sustainability challenges alone. And fortunately, there's increased understanding among all parties of the need for this collaboration. And the conversations like those we have here today are really essential. And an active participation of the business sector is critical to form the solutions going forward. It is only business and the private sector that has the capacity to apply business solutions to complex problems, innovating with new technologies, scaling the application of new solutions, securing large-scale financing, and creating jobs and livelihoods. And the business sector understands that it is in its own self-interest to act, and that business as usual is not an option. Business simply cannot succeed in a society that fails. Governments can facilitate change through good regulations, and business is not against regulation, but business looks to help in creating smart and innovative regulations which support a desired policy from society and which creates a level playing field. Business is also not against society putting a price on externalities, like a price on carbon. Actually, many large corporations are asking for this to happen, and this to have predictable frame conditions moving forward. Universities and research institutions, they develop so many promising technologies that we probably already today have the technologies necessary to secure a sustainable future, even with 9 billion people living on Earth with a higher standard than today. Our challenge is to scale such technologies, set smart regulations and effective standards for their use, and to provide the markets and capital for them to succeed. So while we need to look at the global risk picture, we in DNVGL believe that the time is right to also look through a lens of opportunity. And this is why, together with the UN Global Compact and the Monday Morning Global Institute, we have initiated the Global Opportunity Report. I believe it is at your table now. This first edition was launched in Zurich in January uh, this year, and we also had good support from Dr. Pachauri and Terry in preparing it. And with this, we wish to enhance the concern instilled by risk with the confidence inspired by opportunities. 
So we've select, selected five global risks. Extreme weather, lack of fresh water, unsustainable urbanization, uncommunicable diseases, and a lock-in to fossil fuels. And the Global Opportunity Report is then intended to demonstrate how these five global risks can be turned into 15 opportunities for societies and companies across several industry sectors. And this can only be done through the transformation of knowledge into sustainable opportunities for society and for business. And for us, by definition, every true opportunity is sustainable, uh, meaning that there are chances to create long-term value and not just short-term uh, profit. So all of these 15 examples will demonstrate that. But more than anything else, we hope that the Global Opportunity Report is a journey of a changing mindset. So far, close to 7,000 thought leaders, change makers, and experts from all over the world have taken part in co-creating the report and developing its open innovation network. And in addition to identifying 15 opportunities for sustainable growth, the project has tested the confidence in these opportunities through a survey among more than 6,000 leaders from the public and private sector. And we have broken the replies down on different axes like industry sector, geographical area, age, and gender. And this is where I really become excited and particularly about being here today. Because of all the respondents in all of the countries in the world, India came out on top with respect to valuing the opportunities highest. I'm also encouraged that young leaders are the most optimistic, also about smart regulations, and that women are more supportive of new sustainable solutions. So with its demography and large potential in involving women stronger in leadership, this in my mind proves that India will be at the forefront of the change towards a safer and more sustainable world. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Andre. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Richard Fedrizi, CEO and founding chair of U.S. Green Building Council. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Valori. It's great to be with you all today. In this esteemed company of global business leaders, it might seem unusual to have included an NGO like the U.S. Green Building Council as a part of this panel. However, where green buildings are concerned, our LEED rating system has been the catalyst for creating markets for energy efficient, water efficient, resource efficient buildings that reduce waste and carbon emissions and improve the comfort and well-being for all that, that occupy them. The uptake of LEED around the world continues to amaze me. More than 12.4 billion square feet of certified commercial space, more than 26,000 certified commercial projects with 40,000 still in the pipeline. We are certifying more than 2 million square feet every single day as our nearly 200,000 LEED professional credential holders work to implement LEED in more than 150 countries and territories around the globe. More than 180,000 homes are registered with a third of those already certified and 60% of those going to the affordable housing category. And it's through the use of LEED as a roadmap and here in India, also Griha as a roadmap, that owners and operators of new and existing buildings around the world have been able to have an immediate and measurable influence on reducing their energy consumption and grease, greenhouse gas emissions and improving their carbon footprints and their bottom lines. But these benefits are not possible without the full participation of the business community. Not only are they improve their own corporate performance, but as they are encouraged to improve their supply chains as well. And maybe most of all, their ability to use sustainability lens and innovation drivers for creating new products and new services and new protocols that taken together are having a huge impact on climate change in the built environment segment. So I get deeply discouraged when I see 
that PricewaterhouseCoopers annual global CEO survey released at Davos a few weeks back failed to even ask 1,322 business leaders about their global warming concerns. And that's because in the previous year, only 10% had that concern identified. We all know that most of the conversations about climate change are depressing, obviously, and many CEOs' short-term fears are overwhelming their ability to register the magnitude of the problem, and consequentially, they're missing a tremendous opportunity. The list of companies who are developing a wealth of new products that are flooding the market to support high-performance green buildings is impressive. But there's a broader conversation about the market value of companies who are identified by consumers as living their sustainable values across the entire corporate experience. For USGBC, LEED was our only starting point. We've been exploring ways to provide decision-making data to companies so that their sustainability journeys are faster. Things like our Green Building Information Gateway, which provides asset-level data to organizations and comparative data across their portfolios. We also recently acquired the Green Real Estate Sustainability, uh, Sustainability Benchmark, uh, the acronym is GRESB, a portfolio-level scoring tool for investors and financial institutions looking to assess the sustainable real estate efforts of large developers. Taken together, we're pro providing another innovation for the market that can help guide companies and their climate change mitigation strategies. We have long been admiring the work of Dr. Pachori and Terry and have been do them, what they've been doing here in India and Southeast Asia to make companies strong partners in their efforts. That prompted us to partner with Terry last year to compress the period of time that India needs to improve the performance of existing buildings, which is a great opportunity for all of us. Across every industry, environmental, every industry, environmental sustainability has become an incredible business opportunity, and I'm convinced business leaders who see the business opportunities of aggressively addressing climate change will provide the solutions we need and the profits because of it. Thank you. Great. Well, one of the things we really want to do is to make this as interactive as possible. So as the leaders complete it, uh, and you kind of hear the comments, it'll be good for you to formulate the questions uh, through this process. And at the end of the, the session, when the leaders kind of speak, um, it'll be very nice for us to have this two-way dialogue going forward. With this, I'm going to actually turn it over to Mr. Randall Newton, Vice President of Enterprise Engineering, Ingersoll Rand. Thank you, Mr. Valuri. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Ingersoll Rand, we're a $13 billion diversified industrial manufacturing company. Um, we have some brands that you may or may not be familiar with, including Club Car. Club Car happens to be one of the world's largest producers of electric vehicles. Uh, we have the Ingersoll Rand brand, uh, manufacturer of industrial products like air compressors, power tools, pumps, and material handling equipment. We have the Train air conditioning brand, uh, manufacturer of both residential, commercial, and industrial air conditioning equipment. And Thermal King, uh, which is uh, a brand of truck trailer refrigeration equipment so the trucks and trailers, marine containers that transport food, fresh food uh, around the world, typically have Thermal King type products on them. And they also manufacture bus and rail air conditioning systems. In October of last year, Ingersoll Rand made a commitment to the Clinton Global Initiative and the UN Climate Summit that we would significantly reduce the direct greenhouse gas emissions in our products by 2020. This was a bold proposal because, to be specific, we, we said we would reduce 50% of the direct greenhouse gas emissions from refrigerants in our product in that short period of time, that we would reduce by 35% the emissions in our factories, in our fleets, and in our office buildings in that period of time, 
that we would spend $500 million on new product and new technology development for energy efficiency and new refrigerants, and that we would, that we would serve as a collaborator in the industry to try to bring other industries together, other government groups together, to try to come up with some solutions for global warming. Now this was and is a bold proposal, and we did not know four months ago and still don't know exactly how we're going to go about accomplishing it. We don't have a, a specific roadmap uh, that's laid out that will, that will get us to those goals. But we have made some extraordinary progress over the past four months that I'll be happy to share in this session or later in the conference if you want to talk separately. To accomplish this goal, there are three elements that we took into account that we believe are going to be necessary to get to this goal very quickly by 2020. First of all, we will not sacrifice safety to our employees or to our customers to achieve our goals. This means that we are not going to use flammable refrigerants, toxic refrigerants uh, in our products that could endanger the safety uh, of either our employees uh, or our customers. To date, all of the work that we've done is on refrigerants. All of the refrigerants that we've introduced are considered uh, ash rate class A1 refrigerant, meaning they have very low toxicity uh, and are non-flammable. The, uh, the second thing that we, that we hold as important in changing out these refrigerants is that we will not sacrifice energy efficiency in our products in order to achieve this goal. It's absolutely critical that we maintain or enhance energy efficiency during this transformation. You know, most of our products run on electricity. Um, the electricity typically is generated by fossil fuels. Anything that we do to go to new refrigerants that reduce energy efficiency of the products, in my opinion, is going backwards. And so we won't tolerate that in these products. And third, the third thing that we're doing is we're trying to find or develop refrigerants that will allow us to use most of the hardware currently used on the products that we build today. So not necessarily drop-in replacements, but near drop-in replacement refrigerants because it will significantly reduce the amount of time to get to market uh, with the products. To date, we have found alternatives. Some are and some are not yet on the market for our 123, our 134A, and our, our 404A. And we're currently testing some alternatives to our 410A and another alternative that's even lower global warming potential to our 404A. Last week, Train was the first uh, manufacturer globally to announce a product uh, that would have a refrigerant that would replace our 404A in commercial, or excuse me, our uh, 134A in commercial chillers uh, at the AHR show in Chicago. Uh, we also talked to other manufacturers who are doing work uh, along this front. And while this refrigerant may not be the long-term solution, we can get up to two-thirds reduction in greenhouse gas potential by the new refrigerants that we're using, only making very minor changes to the equipment. Use of lower GWP near drop-in alternatives means that investments in tooling and in new product development is not lost, and that transition to lower our carbon footprint can happen extremely quickly. It also means that investments that are made by our customers, investments that are made by our competitors in refrigerants that they use today won't be lost. And I think this is critical as we try to move quickly to some form of a solution or a partial solution to the problem. As an example, we've made some significant investments to our factories here in India uh, and are continuing to make investments over the last few years. But the refrigerants that we're proposing to go to will not require us to change tooling, will not require us to change uh, or throw out that investment. We have the technology and the refrigerants today to move quickly and safely and to make an immediate impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So why wouldn't we? Why should we wait? And this was what we were thinking when we, when we made our commitment uh, uh, at the Clinton Initiative uh, and the UN uh, last year. So I would challenge all of the manufacturers here in the room 
to look very closely at this, to think about making a commitment in the future, in the very near future, uh, to make an immediate impact on the environment. Uh, so let me uh, request Mr. Glenn Schmidt from BMW to talk about the exciting work that's happening. Great, thank you very much for those words of introductions. Uh, we're grateful also to Terry to have this opportunity to be able to speak. What I'd like to do very briefly, um, without taking up too much time because we wanted to leave some time for discussion, is to tell you um, how BMW has tried to incorporate sustainability into their business model. Now we've heard a number of times bold statements being made such as sustainability is part of our business, it's part of our DNA, but what does that really mean? What challenges come with that? And uh, what are some of the examples that we have? So I'd like to give you some tangible examples of how we've dealt with this. And then I'd like to close very briefly with um, a few observations and with some implications for sustainability and business. Now I think um, when deriving a sustainable business model, I think it's on the one hand very important to have an outside-in perspective to really closely observe what's happening around you, but at the same time, not only change things, but think about you know, what are the inside-out strengths of your business? What are you really good at? What are you known for? What do customers appreciate for, for your products and your services? So finding a good blend between these two things, these two challenges, I think, is really at the heart of uh, the right approach. And now BMW comes traditionally uh, from a perspective of producing large cars, producing swift, fast cars, um, during a period where fuel consumption wasn't very top in the reasons to purchase a vehicle or in the reasons to purchase uh, a BMW. Uh, in 2007, we introduced to customers um, a claim uh, and a strategy that we referred to as efficient dynamics. Now, what does that really stand for? And that I think this gives you maybe an, an idea of how we approach the entire issue. On the one hand, it means improving the efficiency of our cars, reducing fuel consumption, reducing the average CO2 output of our vehicles. But at the same time, it also means ensuring that a BMW is still dynamic and still fun to drive. So on the one hand, combining sustainability with qualities and traits that you're known for and that you're good at. And I think numbers really speak for themselves. Uh, since 1995 to 2013, we've been able to reduce uh, the fuel consumption of our new car fleet in Europe by 38%. And it's our declared objective by 2020 to reduce that by over 50% compared to 1995 levels. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that the vehicles are becoming more boring, that we're offering less horsepower, less torque. In fact, all of these things have increased, so it's efficient dynamics. Uh, really making sustainability a strong selling proposition to your customers. The next level, the next challenge is zero emission driving. Uh, and that uh, entails a very holistic, a very comprehensive approach from our perspective. And our answer is BMW i, uh, which is a new sub-brand that we've introduced uh, around the world for sustainable driving and for um, tailpipe emission-free electric driving. And we've taken a very comprehensive approach that covers the entire value chain, uh, which starts in the production process, which goes into the usage, as well as the recycling of the vehicle. And now I could you know, start by giving you a traditional pitch for the BMW i3, which you see displayed outside, which would involve figures such as horsepower and acceleration. The car has 170 horsepower, has 250 newton meters of torque, accelerates from zero to 60 in under four seconds. These are strong emotional selling points, but what we're also doing is we are referring to other things within the value chain and making that a sales proposition to our customers. For example, we use 100% renewable energy to produce the vehicles. We use wind energy uh, in our production facility in Leipzig in eastern Germany. We've been able to reduce water consumption by 70%, reduce energy consumption by 50%, and you will even find this vehicle with stickers with these numbers on them. So, I think that's one of the challenges and one of the answers as well, to really think about how you can sus sell sustainability to your customers. And I think the final step that we're taking now is going beyond the product and thinking in terms of services, offering mobility services. Now, the youngest customer group that the BMW group currently has does not actually own a car. You may be asking yourselves, how is that possible? BMW sells vehicles. It's because we offer car sharing. Um, 
called Drive Now, and the people who use this car sharing service don't own a car. So I think you need to adapt your business model and to think about really how you can sell sustainability. I'd like to conclude now with a few implications. What does this mean? I think this is one point we may be touching on during the discussion. All of these sustainable business models can't be done by ourselves. We need to have a healthy ecosystem. In the case of electric mobility, we need energy companies to be playing along, providing renewable energy. We need uh, providers of charging infrastructure. Or in the world of digital mobility services, we need to work together with innovative startup companies to come up with good ideas, good apps, good solutions, connecting different forms of transportation. So there we need to have third parties helping us. And I think really, in order to bring sustainability to the next level from a business perspective, to bring climate protection to the next level, we really need to be thinking about sustainability as a strong selling proposition to our customers. Think of sustainability as a differentiator. Think about uh, sustainability as a competitive advantage. The fact that our cars are fast and efficient helps us to sell them. So it's a real uh, USP that we have, and also a very, very strong, strong sales argument. So thank you very much for your attention. Great. Great work happening there. Uh, let me turn this to Mr. Jeff Seabright, Chief Sustainability Officer at Unilever. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who were here yesterday <coughs> and saw our Chief Executive at Unilever, Paul Pullman, you'll know that I am not the Chief <coughs> Sustainability Officer. He is the Chief Sustainability <laughs> Officer, and I just uh, work hard to support him, uh, which is a great, a great job to have. Um, I guess what I would like to do maybe is to step back and talk a little bit less about Unilever and more about the role of business. And we heard a little bit about that from Paul yesterday. But I mean, I really do believe that, that business has an indispensable role to play in advancing both the climate and the development agenda, not just this year, which is an important year, a very critical year. But this is a marathon, not a sprint. And we're going to have to go the distance. And so putting the full force of business in terms of the, the innovation, the human capital, uh, the connections, the supply chains that can be brought to bear on the challenges of low carbon inclusive growth is, is absolutely vital and, uh, and, and I really do believe is going to be uh, an increasingly important part uh, of the solution. And I think a way to frame this uh, is, is around um, footprint, handprint, and blueprint. And let me just unpack that a little bit. Footprint clearly is, is, is what we all know, which is Many businesses are working hard to reduce their environmental impact, their footprint. Uh, at Unilever uh, last year, we uh, had reduced by 63% in absolute terms the amount of CO2 we emitted from manufacturing operations, you know, based on um, basis 1995. That's great. Uh, but the reality is that if all that we do as businesses, as we continue to grow, is to, is to reduce uh, our footprint, we're still going to be shy of what science tells us we need to be doing. So we need to be thinking about how we can put our handprint, which is really where we have unique opportunity to leverage change in the marketplace, to drive transformational change that will fundamentally shift business as usual curve, whether it's the work that Ingersoll Rand is doing on refrigeration uh, or work that we at Unilever uh, have been helping lead on, on cleaning up our supply chains that are contributing to tropical deforestation, which is a major driver of climate change. So working hard as the world's largest buyer of palm oil to make sure that palm oil is sustainably produced and not coming at the expense um, of, of tropical rainforest and climate. And so this notion of handprint uh, is, is a very important one because it means that you can, as a business, working with other businesses across your sector perhaps, have a, an impact far greater than the entire footprint of your operation uh, by shifting markets in a very fundamental way. Um, I suppose the analogy to that in the SDG context for us would be the work that we do on water access, sanitation, and hygiene. We're in the business of, 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 of selling soap, uh, hygiene. We're in the business of water, uh, safe water systems, purit, uh, and we're in the business of, of sanitation uh, in, in our domestos uh, work. And so here in India, for example, we have um, a commitment to reach one out of five Indians uh, by the end of this decade around water sanitation and hygiene, which is um, a, a critical part of the Clean India um, uh, campaign of Prime Minister um, Modi. Uh, but the third element of that, of footprint, handprint, um, 
blueprint is really fitting into the broader sort of public policy uh, uh, structure and debate. And I think business has an important role to play, both in helping raise the level of ambition and creating space for, the, for um, pol politicians to take action by legitimizing these opportunities and making it clear that there's a real economic jobs opportunity, development opportunity uh, to be had, and that businesses support proactive engagement on the part of business. Uh, but we also have a responsibility to speak up and speak out on, on public policy. And I'm very proud just yesterday, um, the B team, which is a group uh, comprised of a dozen or so CEOs, including uh, Paul Pullman, uh, Sir Richard Branson, uh, Ratan Tata, Mary Robinson, who is with us here today, uh, and men, many other um, uh, um, uh, members, uh, issued a call for both businesses and government to, uh, to set a zero net emissions goal by 2050, which is much earlier than has been called for previously, uh, but we believe is consistent with what we need to do to de-risk the, 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 the challenge of runaway climate change. So a net zero emissions call uh, to public policymakers and businesses uh, by, by 2050. So uh, I think that's a, a framework that I, I think is, I find useful to think about in terms of the role uh, that business can play, both in terms of its operational footprint, adding real value in terms of market transformation with a handprint, and engaging on public policy in the, in the blueprint, and we have our work cut out uh, for us. So looking forward to the, the dialogue and the, and the questions. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, let me turn this to the last speaker on the panel, Ms. Namita Vikas, Senior President and Country Head, uh, responsible banking for Yes Bank. And Namita, uh, just from a banking standpoint and from a financial sector standpoint, it will be very helpful for you to kind of throw some light on how the corporate world is working. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tanuri. I think uh, at the outset, I would like to admire Terry because the DSDS uh, has demonstrated a very sustainable model in itself, which is scalable. And over the last 15 years, you know, the kind of longevity that it has built, that's great. So coming to the finance sector, I would say that over two years, uh, uh, la over the last two years, the UN Secretary General has engaged the public and the private sector, globally financial companies and banks, to talk about how we're going to look at financing the entire climate action that's emerging. And banks being very central to an economy, since they infuse capital into the market, it becomes a very uh, important role uh, that one has to look at from a growth development and overall sustainable development perspective. Over the next five years, India faces the world's biggest financing challenge. So what are we looking at? Financial inclusion, which would mean 100 million families. And it's not just about opening bank accounts, but it is about giving access to finance. So one of the biggest movements in the country currently is the uh, Prime Minister's Jandhan Yojana, which not only opens accounts, but it provides insurance plus an overdraft facility for the unbanked people to be able to use that finance. So that's, a, that's the first point. The second is bringing affordable and reliable supplies of clean water and energy to all the 1.3 billion inhabitants in the country. And the third is investing enterprises that will provide livelihoods uh, for an extra 10 million job seekers each year. In addition to that, the government and we have taken targets on about 165 gigawatts of renewable energy that will uh, be put into the system. All this needs financing, which means that the Indian financial system that will have to, while there's a tremendous opportunity, it will have to stretch to meet these aspirations. Yesterday, we had a very interesting dialogue here where we were looking at how, what kind of fi approaches that financial systems need to build. And what starkingly came out is aligning the conventional system with sustainable development goals will be very important. And there are three, four key interventions that would be required. One, at the policy and a regulation level. So renewable energy funding is becoming uh, a necessity today. So like uh, Randall mentioned, uh, at the UN Climate Summit, we too took a commitment of funding 500 megawatts of renewable energy every year, and that's a target that the bank has taken. However, there's something called the priority sector lending in the country where banks have to 
lend 40% of their balance sheet towards certain sectors, agri, education, and so on. If there is a classification of renewable sector lending, then really there's a pressure on the financial system here in India to look at uh, these sectors uh, with a focused uh, behavior. So I think that, that's a very important point. Sec on the, another side, a common framework towards banking guidelines. So I'll tell you, we are able to uh, proactively source development uh, finance uh, because we have very strong environment and social standards as a framework that the bank looks at when it looks at the portfolios and assets, so with our clients. I think that has helped us a great way. And if there is an Indian banking standard that gets formulated, then there's so much more efficiency that gets built into the system. We're talking about this whole circular economy. And what's important is looking from a finance lens, looking at businesses, waste to energy, uh, food that gets into energy or clean technology. I think, I think you know, these are the important areas for banks uh, really would look at. And you know, one more point I want to bring here is about how do you innovate for bottom of the pyramid? So the need is that, so for example, at Yes Bank, we, we saw a challenge where migrant labor, uh, which lived in cities, did not have access to bank accounts on account of uh, certain know your customer norms that the banks had to follow. So what we did is we actually innovated, and today about 85 lakh unique transactions are happening, and there is about transactions worth $160 million. And here it's a transaction which is about $100 per transaction. So you can imagine the volume of transactions that, that is happening. Another area very importantly is the MSME sector, which is large consumers of energy and at the same time don't have the management capacities or the wherewithal like large corporates to be able to bring in energy efficiency. So what Yes Bank has really done is we have started audits with energy audits with 50 MSME companies and on the basis of the report card look at funding technologies through our CSR grant funds. So we're also leveraging our CSR in that manner and also looking at how do you build efficiencies within the system. So I think you know I, and one final point was on measurement. I think measurement was very important. And yesterday, Mr. Paul Polman highlighted one very interesting thing. What you measure, you treasure. So, uh, you know, and we say that what you measure, you monitor. So measurement, monitoring, and reporting not only brings in transparency and accountability, but it actually gives you a hang of what is a consumption pattern. So I think these are some very important points from a bank's perspective that one needs to look at. And really, the need of the hour is aligning financial systems to sustainable development. Great. Thank you very much. So uh, before I turn it over to the speakers, I wanted to make a couple of comments. And I do recall, I think this was about a couple of years ago, uh, where I was uh, invited to speak at the Peter Drucker Management Forum in, in Europe. And I do remember that there were many leaders over there. And one of the questions that was asked was, of the corporate sector, what do you think about shareholder value maximization? How, how can we actually continue to do this on and on, over and over, again and again? And I think a number of us during that session realized uh, a fundamental truth. The fundamental truth was the cost of social unrest will always overtake the possibility of profit maximization. And I think that's true. And I think we see that in India. We see that in a number of places. And a number of you are from Delhi. Some of you probably are from Gurgaon, too. I do recall the water wars in Gurgaon, where a couple of villages came out because one village didn't get water and one village got water. Uh, we see that down south. Now, so, of course, from a corporate sector, I'm taking an extreme stand of saying that if in the future, from an environmental sustainability standpoint, from a climate change standpoint, if we create a lot of social unrest, then there is an issue for the corporate world. But at the same time, We've got to look at development. We've got to look at economic growth. We've got to look at good life standards, which means that we need investments. We need the corporate sector to look at how they can actually build on what has already been built in a very, very responsible way. 
So for the panel, I'm going to actually open up three or four key topics. And I would request the panel members to actually randomly take an opinion and take a question each and give their thoughts on this. And after that, we will actually have the audience kind of, uh, you know, have a two-way session with the panel. I think four areas, and to the panel, I would say, if, you, if you're looking at this broader structure of the potential social unrest because of environmental considerations and climate change, and I think a number of speakers have spoken about it, the water levels going up, the heat maps changing very rapidly. What kind of regulations do we expect from governments? But I think a number of times we get actually saddled or curtailed by not proactive regulations that allow us to bring in the right technologies and the right processes to the society. What do we think about convergence and collaboration? I think it's extremely important that we, as a society, as nations, as corporate sectors, as NGOs, as governments, sometimes we continue to actually build and drive a very specific vertical domain approach as opposed to bringing in technologies together and creating a solution which can actually impact to the larger society. How do we actually bring this collaboration model across, whether it's a financial institution, whether it's a technology solution, whether it's a process capability, how do we bring this to actually improve the living standards of, of human society at large? And thirdly, this whole piece of we've been talking in India about making CSR mandatory. Is it good? Is it bad? Because sometimes the organizations do take a stand that you know we are doing a lot of good work. But sometimes there's also what I would call as a flouting of the rule or the law of saying no. You know, we'll find a way of demonstrating that we are doing CSR, but we're not actually implementing what we need to implement to the society to get the living standards up. So broadly, if I look at these three topics, and I'm opening it up to the channel, uh, to the to the to the participants or the leaders over here on what do we think about the corporate responsibility towards social responsibility? What do we think about this collaboration and convergence across nations, across technologies? And what do we think about the government regulations, whether they are proactive, they're changing, they're not changing, to help society build? I'm going to open this up, and I'm going to probably ask you to start this uh, from your viewpoint, and then we can actually take everybody's uh, you know, input. Well, the, the way that the U.S. Green Building Council, through the LEED system, looks at, uh, let's, t let's talk, talk about social unrest for right now. Um, it has taken us a very long time to understand how a rating system developed in the United States that migrated to 150 countries around the world would, in effect, be valuable at the local level. So we, we created an uh, international roundtable. We have what we call alternative compliance paths. And the entire process of building a sustainable building, which has now evolved into sustainable communities and, and, and growing outward, um, it, it really brings in the, the countries themselves to talk about the issues that are important that allows these rating s systems and tools. And LEED is not the only one. In the UK, you have BRIAM, and Germany, you have DGMB, and here in uh, India, you have GRIHA and others. Um, but when you start looking at the ability for these systems to influence the social issues, in LEED right now, we have what we were calling social equity credits. We actually incentivize the development of projects to look at ideas of how are people going to source food? How are people going to source clean water? How are people going to get jobs that are somehow a part of this development process in the first place? And it's a small step, but obviously, you know, a system like that, which is not a regulation, it is not a government regulation, it is a voluntary regulation of sorts, one, what we're hoping is that the positive net effect of people having the opportunity to see a, a development project turn into jobs and food and safety and, and a variety of other things that nurture a community instead of take from it, we, we hope we're on the right track and, and have some ability there. The green building movement itself started in the footprint of a building, but it is quickly evolving 
into not only the environmental attributes and, and, and success opportunities, but, but now the, the social and, and maybe even more importantly, the wellness or the health aspects of, of how communities uh, are affected by these projects. So our ability to help people uh, gain access to clean water and cleaner air, um, uh, better food sources, non-toxic materials, and so forth, it is, uh, it's, it's the journey now that we're on, we're embarking on, and we're hoping uh, we see some positive results very quickly. Great, great. Yes? Yeah, so <clears throat> just quickly, I mean, I, I think on the public policy, I would just say three things. One, uh, stop subsidizing things that we don't want, uh, like fossil fuels, um, in, in terms of the, the future economy. Uh, put a price on carbon. Uh, and thirdly, set ambitious sort of public goals Net zero emissions by 2050 would be an example, uh, and the incentives in place to help support getting there, including working collaboratively with the private sector. Most importantly, I think in the area of, of finance, I think that obviously is the oxygen, you know, of, of, of a market economy, and finding ways to to um, link public support and private capital flows uh, in order to assure that we're getting the right kinds of investments to to move us with a sense of urgency. So I think that on the public policy. On collaboration, um, if I could go back to my sort of um, simplistic footprint, handprint, blueprint, I think if you look at what the consumer goods sector has done in, in trying to clean up the supply chains that we have around the four commodities that drive tropical deforestation, palm oil, soy, beef, and timber, those four commodities alone contribute roughly half of tropical deforestation uh, around the world today, which in, in and of itself is a 10 to 15 percent factor in total emissions. So if we took half of the rate of tropical deforestation out of, of, of the equation, that's five to seven and a half percent of total warming. That's huge. Uh, and that, that's one sectoral initiative. Uh, we're not anywhere near there. We're still working hard at it. But you know, more than two-thirds of, of globally traded palm oil is now committed to be sustainably sourced. So we're making some progress driving that sort of sectoral collaboration around handprint, I think is really important. Imagine if there were adjacent 10 sectors, each of which had identified real lever points uh, to help address uh, climate um, low carbon growth and, and make that market transformation. That sort of radical pre-competitive collaboration among sectors, business sectors, could be a very powerful uh, contribution to the kind of the solutions track uh, going into Paris and to carry us well beyond Paris to help implement where we need to go in terms of a low carbon economy. Great. Glenn, transportation is a big issue. What do you think about just those three areas, uh, especially on regulations? Okay. What would be your? Sure. I, I think in terms of regulation, um, from a regulatory perspective, it's, it's about getting the right mix between carrot and stick. Um, on the one hand, finding objectives, targets, CO2 levels uh, that are ambitious, that are deliberately difficult to reach, but at the same time, um, also thinking about incentives. You know, uh, what type of infrastructure do you need? How can we facilitate the introduction of um, new sustainable forms of mobility? And if you're only doing one side of the equation, uh, it's not going to work. So you need to have a good mix. And I think that's something that we've seen in, in many of the markets where we've introduced electric vehicles. Uh, we, we've had numerous examples uh, involving California because of the pre presence of uh, Governor Schwarzenegger. But if I take the state of California as an example with electric vehicles, we have on the one hand uh, ambitious regulation, but on the other hand, we also have government support for infrastructure, government incentives, and that combined with a, a high level of awareness and receptivity to new technology, and then you can really see uh, that a new technology like electric mobility really takes up. Um, in terms of collaboration, um, all of these disruptive new technologies that have sustainability are collaborative business models. Electric vehicles, as a good example, linking the transport sector to the energy sector, um, two, en two huge industrial sectors that have never worked together. To facilitate that type of dialogue, to bring those parties together, we need to have the support of government. So government does make a difference in this case. But government cannot be the only factor that's driving things. Ultimately, it needs to be competition. It needs to be a solution that you're offering to the customer that's superior. 
And maybe one closing note uh, concerning the question of sustainability and shareholder value. I think it's really a question of how you define sustainability. If sustainability is defined as having a business model that's future-proof, um, then there is really no, uh, there's no conflict between these things. And if I think about the example of BMW i, our electric vehicles, um, that has helped us to reach our CO2 targets and will help us in the future. It has given us an excellent story to talk about. It is a proposition to customers. And it's also a strong proof of the fact that our business model is future-proof and that we have innovative answers, which helps to increase the stock price. So that's really uh, at the heart of what we're doing. Great. Randy, your thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's interesting. Uh, we, we talk about regulations. In a lot of cases, people believe that industry is not in favor of regulations. And I'll tell you, even without regulations, at least in the industry that I'm in, our competitors and ourselves have always competed, always wanted to have products on the market that were the most energy efficient or that had the lowest carbon footprint. And we've always had products in our portfolio that, that were far better than the minimum regulatory requirements uh, in the marketplace. And so the competition in the marketplace has driven us that way anyway for a couple of reasons. One, by finding more energy efficient ways to compress gas, as an example, in a refrigeration cycle, we are able to lower our carbon footprint by taking carbon, excuse me, by taking material out of the products. So building products for less money um, and making them more competitive in the marketplace. Uh, you know, Doing things like taking a stand and moving forward quickly on things like reducing our global footprint are the right things to do, and we do have customers that will reward us for that, but it's also a risky way to go, and I would contend that we would be in favor of more regulations because once regulations are in place, it takes a lot of risk out of the new product development activities and the investments that you need to make for the future. You have a roadmap. You have a goal. Um, you have a target to shoot for, uh, and, it, and it just makes things all that much easier for us uh, from an industrial standpoint. Thank you, Randy. Um, Namita, specifically from a perspective of, let's say, a country like India, where CSR has actually got quasi-mandated, right? Uh, the government expects to mop up about 20,000 crores. I mean, give, give the number a, a little bit of a, a color to it. But what do you think? You think that just from a, from a corporate standpoint, of course, there's always an argument of saying, you know, responsible companies will always do the right thing in the society. Uh, but wh where do you think that should this be a mandatory program? And if it is, uh, is this the right thing to do? What, what is your take on that? Taxes or mandates that are levied by the government are good or bad. I mean, if you look at this one, like you have the carbon tax in the UK. Uh, if you look at uh, the CSR law, the good news is that 2% expenditure is not compulsory. Reporting is compulsory. So that's one part. So you, a company may choose to say, I spend 0% on CSR and report, and then leave, leave it to your shareholders and your stakeholders to assess where you stand. Or you may say, that the business of business is more than business. You know, Friedman may not like it, but, and therefore, we want to have approaches to do good. Just take the example of India. Giving is not new to India. We had rights since ages, you know, out of religious beliefs or out of tradition. Giving is a part of our culture. Uh, so, you know, donations, or we've seen examples like Tata's or Birla's doing it. Then came philanthropy, which was more based on the American model, where it is a strategic way of sharing your wealth for a particular cause. And about 10 years back, you had this whole international concepts emerging, which were more around creating uh, value for all. So, so it was really a shared value-based model and creating business case for CSR. So you know, in, in this adversary, if I may just put it, uh, for the lack of any other word, if we look at the opportunity. So I'll just give you an example of what we do at the bank. So for example, financial literacy uh, is core to our business. And the RBI mandates banks to do financial literacy. It's a cost exercise. But today, what has happened is, because we have 
certain money that we can deploy as far as CSR is concerned, we are looking at building a kind of a, so conventionally how it happens is you actually conduct classes or you develop posters and you know send it out. So it's a cost, cost intensive mechanism. So what we, what we are doing is using the CSR money to create a learning management system which touches, which has textbooks, the web, the mobile, the computer-based training and DTH, direct to home. This will go to multiple people across the country. So it's, it's very multidimensional. I mean, you'll have either one of this in any case. And the benefits are we comply. I mean, we would comply, but we would comply more. The scale has gone up. We're educating the unbanked. And there's a growth in our microfinance business because there are borrowers, because they know today they're coming to us to seek money. So I think it's all about making a business case, really. And it's what kind of lens you use to look at CSR. That's, that's what Excellent. I think. Excellent. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to open this up for a quick question and answer session. Uh, we're going to stick to time. As I've been told, that we have to stick to time, and we will stick to time. So if you're planning to ask a question, please state your name, and please state where you're from, and what is the question. Let's avoid comments. Let's just take questions so that you actually get answers from this distinguished panel. Yes, sir. I uh, would like to uh, ask <coughs> each one of the panelists. Uh, quite often, it has been seen that uh, mitigation actions uh, <coughs> have a uh, profit-making profit uh, side in it, uh, and eventually, uh, in course of time, it turns out to be deemed as <coughs> BAU, business as usual. So I would like to uh, <coughs> uh, find out from each one of you what is your commitment towards adaptation uh, while aiming at uh, future sustainability. Thank you. Yesterday, Mr. Debek Bebro um, Bebek Debroy raised an issue regarding TOT by MNCs to the developing <laughs> nations. Now today's, uh, this panel discussion, uh, uh, message being driven is that there is a lot of initiative being taken by the corporate. But that makes me think, is it enough? Or like my uh, earlier person, uh, he just asked, same thing. It's business as usual. The investment plans, like specifically Mr. Newton mentioned about some million dollars being committed for new facilities, plan for 2020 reduction in GAG emissions. So can you get to the question? Yeah. So is it being done only for pure commercial interest or as a commitment towards the sustainability? OK. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, anybody in the panel wants to take Jeff? Yeah, so I, mean, I, I think one of, the, uh, one of the attributes that we're seeing emerge in the business community is moving, in a sense, beyond CSR to looking at fundamentally shifting the business models to integrate sustainability as part of the business model and, and, and using the power of business, the innovation, the, the human capital, the financial capital, the, the, the reach to be able to elevate our games you know, in terms of, of commercial enterprises that are adding social value. And I think that's, that's the aspiration that, that, that certainly Unilever has set out on. We are far from where we need to be. I think we're, we're not at all content with where we are. We know we have a lot further uh, to go. But I think that, uh, that effort to use the power of business to change business as usual, to be a disruptive force in the marketplace, to help advance the challenges around climate change and around development. You know, think about mobile telephony and, and distance learning and education and, and water access and sanitation. All of these areas are ripe opportunities for business with purpose. Thank you. Um, there's a lady who raised her hand somewhere. No? May I? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ajit Yadav. Uh, I'm from the corporate world. In fact, my best introduction is I'm ex-Unilever, if you like. Uh, so I'm addressing to Jeff. I love the model that you outlined, the footprint, handprint, and the blueprint. The question really that takes you to is this, that particularly which holds significance to an eco space like this, from the manufacturing point of view, how do you take this initiative down the line to your vendors, your suppliers, and so on, 
be it to suppliers of STP, LAB, and so on and so forth, and these edible and inedible oils and so on. Would you reflect on the initiatives or the challenges that you have faced to make sure that down the line that you as, a, as an entity, an enterprise, also want to deliver to the last word? And what advice will you have for a you know, society or country like this on this particular aspect? Well, after, after last night, I'm not sure I want to give India any advice. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, now, an example on, on palm oil um, is, is, uh, is the following, and that is you know, we have a commitment to, to, to sustainably source palm oil, to make sure that we're not buying palm oil that has been produced uh, through the trop through, uh, tropical deforestation, primarily in Indonesia, Malaysia, but increasingly in, in West Africa as well. Um, and, and the reality of that is, is that in order to continue to meet incremental demand for palm oil without encroaching on, on virgin forests, you need to increase the productivity of existing plantations and shift uh, new plantations to existing degraded lands. So conversion of existing land use and intensification for smallholder farmers. We're working in North Sumatra where we put in a, a new plant to process palm oil to reach out you know, through our, our, uh, our partners in, in North Sumatra to help improve the yields of smallholder farmers so that they will be more productive, they will generate greater incomes for themselves, hence a development benefit and, and an income benefit, and an increased yield, nearly doubling their, their yields of palm oil, which is good for us because we're able to then source that palm oil, they get a fair price, and they're generating twice as much. So taking it all the way down the supply chain to, to, the, to the actual smallholder farmer. Thank you. Uh, so now there are going to be two controls. There can't be any more questions for Jeff. He's already answered two questions. And we're going to have some diversity over here. We're going to have the lady ask the question, and that'll be the last question, gentlemen. I'm told we've got to okay. stick to time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. My name is Cynthia Currents. I'm with World Vision. And I appreciate all the information that's been shared and the perspective from um, and what's incumbent on government representatives as well as corporate representatives, even academia, and earlier the entertainment with the Terminator with us here. What I really haven't heard is your opinion about the role of the nonprofit, the NGOs. What, what about strategic alliances? How could roles that are strategic with NGOs be helpful um, across the board for all agendas and perhaps make things more powerful in the end? I'll leave it to all of you who wants to make a Why statement. Why don't you start? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, like uh, Mr. Valuri mentioned, that there is almost about uh, 22,000 crores that's going to get uh, pumped into the system because of the CSR Act. And uh, there is a large role that the civil society plays in actually doing the ground level implementation. So, so building capacities within the NGOs currently is the most uh, important thing as well as the challenge that most of the corporates look at because uh, while very well-meaning, very good operational NGOs are all on ground, because there are pressures on reporting, it is very important to measure the social impact, the beneficiaries, and what's the call for action that's coming out of the projects that's, that goes feeding into back to the report. Uh, I, I can tell you what we are doing. So we have our YES Foundation. So through the foundation, we are building capacities. We have programs where we work with NGOs for four months on their financial controls, their risk management, their performance management, compliance issues. So all these areas, and we are building their capacities to ensure that they would be able to deliver to the last mile. And this is not just, we work with around 32 NGOs in the country, and this is not just limited to these 32 NGOs, but currently we're running a program with 80 NGOs who are going through this program. So I think it is uh, in the benefit of the corporates themselves to be able to train their entire value chain and look at NGOs, bring them into the fold, and help them. We have also have a volunteering program where young managers within the bank volunteer to work with NGOs on certain financing or marketing or you know helping them build their collateral. So that's also one more program that we run. So I think those are the kind of mechanisms that we need to bring in. Richard. Yeah, and I just I just want to add to that as the only NGO on the panel. I think it's uh, strategic alliances are critical. I think to the future of of accelerating the plan to. 
uh, uh, to, to address all of the issues that we're here to talk about today uh, and this week. Uh, we have seen tremendous uh, uptake in our ability to align with other organizations like the Terry Organization here in India to be able to accelerate the plan to address the conversion of existing buildings. You can imagine if, if here in India, 99% of the building stock are the existing buildings, and the great majority of those are, are uh, desperately in need of energy, water, and waste kinds of strategies, that it's not something that a simple rating system or even one product or another can, can address. So working together as, as uh, a government uh, uh, alignment of NGOs, working with partners that are uh, uh, corporations, um, working uh, in harmony to deliver an end product that can quickly uh, incentivize uh, people who desperately might want to increase the performance, the energy performance, the environmental performance, and the health performance of their structures. Um, that's really the only way that we can do it. I hope the future, and, we, and believe it or not, globally right now, it's incredibly difficult to put a true value on a building that has reduced its energy by 40%, its water use by 50%, its toxins by 80 or 90%, and anything going to a landfill by almost 100%, it's almost impossible to find a favorable financial rate to incentivize that kind of activity, or even, even more importantly right now, insurance rates that could be uh, extended to these organizations and these businesses and these owners to give them the idea that uh, taking all that positive action really was worth something, that there was a reason why they did it. And, and I hope those collaborations, those alignments uh, will result in some very pos positive strategies for the future. Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we close the session. I really want to thank the panel over here and also thank the entire audience for being patient. I hope it was a good session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.